Okay, we would like to continue with um, a, sh a brief story about the EKV model. And um, before I do so, maybe a little introduction. Um, maybe you heard about uh, MOSFETs and you studied the behavior of MOSFETs like there is a quadratic relation between the volt, the, the gate source voltage and the, and the drain current. Um, and we could use this during the design. Uh, for designing the proper operating point, the proper geometry of a transistor. But unfortunately, in modern transistors, this relation isn't, isn't valid in a large region. It's not quadratic because of uh, short channel effects and because we, also, we often use MOSFETs be, well, be, almost below the threshold in very weak inversion. And then this relation is not valid. And it would be nice to have some, some uh, means to estimate what GM would be as a function of the current, because then we may we can simply relate small signal models that we are going to use during the design to the device parameters and the operating conditions. And that is um, why I would like to tell you a little bit about the MOS EKV model, because it's more suited for that. So let's start with this. MOS operation. First, the operation to understand the physical operation of a MOS. I, I hope you all know it, but it's just see it as a, as a short recap. So here we have a uh, very simple uh, cross section of a CMOS uh, uh, IC, uh, uh, IC made in CMOS process. And here we have the PMOS. It is made in an N well and the CMOS here, the NMOS is displayed in place on the substrate. <clears throat> This is the, the, the cross section, and this is the way we are going to describe its behavior. Usually we have a voltage, a positive voltage on the drain, we have a positive voltage on the gate, and we will measure and describe the drain source current as a function of the drain source voltage and the gate source voltage. You could flip easily the gain, uh, the source, sorry, the source, and the drain. If you look at the picture above, it's just exactly the same. If the device is symmetrical, there's no, there's no distinction between source and drain. You can just flip the two things. And then you would call one the reverse operation and the other the forward operation. But whatever you call reverse or forward would then not at all be interesting, of course. This is definitely not the case for power MOSFETs because they are uh, not symmetrical at all, but for uh, many small signal MOSFETs, this is valid. So let's see what happens. If we apply no voltage, there's no current. That's simple. That is the cutoff region. If we have a small VDS, uh, VDS and a positive value of VDS, so that we for, uh, for now assume that the whole thing is working in saturation, if it will be working, and we start increasing VGS, then what will happen? If we increase VGS, the surface potential, which is here, the, 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 the top of the silicon, uh, which is uh, adjacent to the oxide, it will increase. And there is a capacitive coupling between the two. Here you can see it. We have the gate, we have the interface between the silicon and the oxide, and we have the bulk. And basically, these are two capacitors. And here in the middle, this, this interface, there we talk about the surface potential. And if this surface potential raises, then if it just raises a little bit, then electrons start to flow into the channel. And basically, you are then working with a, let's say, isolated base, but it looks like a lateral PNP, uh, NPN transistor. So NPN. And here we speak in this region of weak inversion. Then the drain current increases exponentially with the gate source voltage. Well, of course, it's not exactly the gate source. It's more the voltage here at the interface. But if we want to make a good MOSFET, you would like to have this capacitor very small, so the, 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 the interface to the bulk and the gate to the interface as large as possible, because that gives you a good coupling. That coupling factor later becomes part of the expression. 
So let's say if we, let's see what happens if we increase it furthermore. So we keep the drain source voltage large enough to be in saturation. And let's see what happens if we um, raise up the gate source voltage above threshold. Threshold is not an absolute value. It's some kind of thing when the transition happens from this, uh, from this exponential behavior to the quadratic behavior. Then in this case, we speak of this when there is a channel formed here, an inversion layer on top of this P substrate, and we have a channel from N, uh, an N channel, and, and that is now conducting. So the drain current then, if it were, if we discard short channel effects, would then increase quadratically with the gate source voltage. That's probably something you know from the operation. Is there also a dependency on the drain voltage? Because here I said the drain voltage is large enough, but what happens if we change the drain voltage? Well, around the drain, there's a depletion layer. And if we increase the drain voltage, then the, the width of the depletion layer will grow a little bit, which means that the channel length reduces a little bit and the current increases slightly. This is called channel length modulation, and I will use CLM for that. So the drain current increases with the drain short voltage. If you go further, if you go beyond uh, the, 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 the allowed value, then of course you get breakdown. But this is definitely something you don't want because it's quite destructive. Short channel effects. That is important because in modern ICs, we always have to deal with short channel effects. If there is a... <coughs> Uh, a very thin oxide um, uh, uh, of, the, of the gate, and we raise the potential of the gate and the field strength in the oxide becomes very high and all electrons are attracted to the surface, which means that the mobility effectively reduces because they're all in the way. So this is what we call vertical field mobility reduction. So it's an reduction of the mobility, so of the transconductance later of the fat, due to the vertical field that is induced by the gate, through, between the gate and the P substrate. There's another effect. If we increase the drain voltage very much, then there is a saturation of the velocity in the lateral direction, or the speed there, so the velocity of the electrons cannot become infinite as well. And that is what we call Vs, velocity saturation. And both uh, effects uh, have as a result that the drain current not longer increases quadratically with the gate source voltage. Actually, in modern MOSFETs, this quadratic region is only very valid in a very small re uh, range of the gate source voltage. Then we have another effect, the drain-induced barrier lowering, Dibble. I don't know if you ever heard of this, but in short MOSFETs, the depletion layer, if we raise the drain voltage, the depletion layer is growing, growing, grower, growing, and this one makes the uh, isolation between these two capacitor plates more effective. It, it makes a larger uh, depletion region, so this capacitor becomes smaller and the coupling becomes better which means that if the coupling becomes better, that the current will increase. So the capacitive coupling, uh, capacitive coupling between the gate and the surface potential increases and the drain current increases. That is most of the effects just on one page of the MOS transistor that you have to understand for design. If we are going to design circuits, what kind of Freedom do we have? What, what is there to design? Well, let's see on the top view of a MOSFET. And here I did uh, two sections. I have two sources and one drain. So you can interconnect the sources and then it's like you made it, you made it two times wider. So this is the width, this is the length and, this, and the number of sections. That is what you can design. All other things overlap, overlap here of the gate to the bulk, overlap uh, gate to the source or drain, um, and uh, the uh, all other parameters, oxide thickness, etc., are process parameters, and you are usually not free to change them during design because that would mess up all the measurement data that they have for a specific process. So 
The design question is, in which way do the performance parameters of a MOS depend on its design parameters? And for this, we need to know what we, what we can design as a designer. So which design parameters are available to the designer? Well, the channel width, I already said, the channel width is something you can design. You're free, it's your layout. Channel length is same, you can also design it. The number of sections or the number of fingers is sometimes called it because they, you are going to interconnect the sources and interconnect drains. If you have more, that gives you like a finger structure. So they call it the number of fingers or the number of sections. The drain current, of course, and the drain source voltage. That is basically everything you can do. The rest is process and you should not touch. The methods. So the methods to find out in which way performance parameters depend on design parameters. How, can we, how do we find those relations? Well, we can use a design manual with graphs and tables and, and scale devices accordingly. So if we have one device given, say, well, if you have this width and this length and this current, then the GM will be so and so much. And then you make that you keep the same current, but you increase uh, the width, then GM will drop and you can, you know how it scales, then you can work with a design uh, manual and use tables and, 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 and scaling formulas. This is very useful, of course, but first of all, you need a design model. Second, it does not always cover all situations, especially for noise, noise impedance that you are driving from, etc. Then you could do uh, just design a de uh, device and um, uh, rely on your simulation model, put it in your simulator and find the performance through simulation. That is another way. That is useful for finding DC operating conditions and small signal model parameters. Um, and that is what we are going to do. In the, we have a, core, a tool for you that can help you with it. We have a Jupyter Notebook tool. Uh, it's in a virtual machine that you can play with the width, with the operating current, with the length, and for example, plot the capacitance as a function of a voltage. So that you can really see, okay, if I use this device in this operating point, then I have to deal with this and this parameters or FT or whatever, what you want. You can also use simplified design models. So if we, let's say, have formulas that, that express this relation, that would be nice. Then we can use just use this design models and e even make that that can help us also with automating the design without using graphs or intermediate simulation of devices. So <clears throat> that is very useful for small signal behavior the bandwidth and the frequency response at the noise. And that is what we will do. And SlyCap has small signal models for this and we will use the EKV model for this purpose. And that is what I wanted to tell you about. So first, a small signal model. I hope you recognize this. This is a hybrid pi small signal model of a MOSFET, including its channel noise associated with the drain current. So this is the, the noise current, and here we have the transconductance. And basically, these are the, the, the physical things behind it. So we have the gate to channel capacitance. We have the small signal transconductance. So that's the derivative of the IDS-VDS relation. Drain gate usually overlap capacitance mainly. The output conductance due to the channel length modulation. Here's an error that should be the drain bulk capacitance. I will change it in the picture, but now it's in the, in the movie. So that's why I tell it as well. Um, and we have the noise current associated with the channel current. That is the model that we would like to have as a designer that is, let's say, simple enough and the complexity is good enough to handle a lot of cases. So we don't need to make it more complex than this. So how do these model parameters depend on the device geometry and the operating conditions? And maybe it is nice to study this a little bit in the uh, EKV model. <coughs> the EKV model dates from work that is done in the 80s and the 90s from Enz, Krummenacher and Vitos. And uh, it is basically a model that models the MOSFET as a completely symmetrical device here. And it assumes a forward current and a reverse current, and it models all regions in one formula. 
So you don't have a linear region and a saturation region. You don't have weak inversion and strong inversion. No, everything can be expressed in one continuously different uh, uh, expression that is continuously differentiable. So the gate source and the drain voltage with respect to the bulk. So it's not about gate source and drain source. No, it's about gate bulk, source bulk and drain bore bulk voltage. That makes it completely uh, symmetrical and gives you an expression for the forward current, the drain source current, if uh, the, you recognize as a function of these voltages and the reverse, the, the source drain current. So if you use it in reverse mode or if it is in the linear mode. So everything is written with respect to the bulk. It is symmetrical, it is charge controlled. I did not put all the capacitors in here. I just made it like an, uh, only the instantaneous part of the model. That's the most important for us now. One thing that it starts with is to define a so-called technology current. It has in it this coupling factor. Oh, let's say I have them all explained. So all this, um, this, this formula is amps. It's like, uh, I think for CMOS 18, it's about uh, 700 nano amps. Oh, and in, in my book and in the presentation, I simply use SI units. So I know in I see technology, it is common to speak about centimeters and, and microfarads and whatever, but you end up with um, always making errors with the constants and the factors 10 that you have to add. So that's why I just went to normal SE units. And then this technology current, I think is something like six, 700 micro, uh, nanoamps for a CMOS 18 process, standard CMOS 18 process. This is the specific capacitance. So farad per square meter. This is the thermal voltage, UT. And here we have this coupling factor, the ratio of the surface potential and the gate voltage, this coupling factor set by N, one over the coupling factor, you could say, because N is, the coupling factor is smaller than unity. The zero uh, field carrier mobility, well, probably you heard of it because I have someone already seen mentioned this, this, this mu. And the oxide thickness um, are all the variables in this uh, expression. So let's see what we have. The whole, the, the beautiful thing about this model is that the weak inversion goes to the strong inversion. So the exponential relation smoothly transits into the uh, into the uh, quadratic relation by using a very special function. And you see ln of exponent is doing nothing. It would just be x over two, you see? So, and here, if exponent is much smaller, then we have another one. So here you see x, x is here if the argument is smaller than zero and x squared, x over two squared, if the argument is larger than zero, which means that we can use this uh, goes from an exponential function to a quadratic function. And that is what we need for uh, going from the weak inversion to the strong inversion if we describe the current. And if you put this voltage in it, this argument in the function, like the difference between the gate voltage and the threshold voltage. So it can be negative if the threshold, if the gate voltage is below the threshold, and then you have this exponential relation. And here is the source voltage or the drain voltage because it's about gate source or gate drain, whatever you do, either the forward current or the reverse current. So forward relates to using source and reverse relates to using drain. Then this is called the inversion coefficient. The inversion coefficient is a measure for the operating domain of the transistor. If am I working in weak inversion, then I have smaller than unity and I have the exponential relation, or am I working in strong inversion, then I have this larger than zero, I'm above threshold and I am, uh, uh, so this is then the quadratic, quadratic relation. 
So in this way, we can define the forward and the reverse current. Don't worry too much about all these complex formulas. It's just about the quadratic and the exponential relation and some things that you, oops, and some things that you know, like the transconductance factor. But here you see that I can now use the inversion coefficient together with the transconductance factor and the W over L to tell me what the current will be. And this transconductance factor, you know probably from the, your other lectures, is mu over the, uh, times the specific uh, capacitance of the gate. And the total drain current is simply the difference between the two. So in the book, I really compare this with a classical model in which we describe the gate source voltage and the drain source voltage and the linear and the saturation region. But here, I would just like to stick to this one because this basically is the, the whole thing and more, it is not more than this. So the channel length modulation is just modeled as an early voltage. So one, the whole current is multiplied with one plus the voltage, the drain source voltage divided by some voltage. Uh, and that is in bipolar transistor would be called the early voltage, but now it's not an early voltage, but it's the same principle. The channel length modulation due to modulation of the thickness of the, of the depletion layer. And the short channel effects are modeled as a reduction of the transconductance factor. So that gives us the possibility to speak about a critical inversion coefficient. That is the value of the inversion coefficient at which the short channel effect set in. Now, here we have this critical inversion coefficient and there are two extra parameters in it. One is the voltage, uh, the, the vertical field mobility, re, uh, uh, mobility re reduction coefficient is theta. And the other one is the critical field strength, the critical lateral field strength for the velocity saturation in the lateral direction. This is a simple model. There are also more, more complex models for this. This is implemented in, uh, in the slide cap to model this, uh, the, the, the short channel effects, basically. Now remember, above critical inversion, so the, the, the transconductance factor drops. That is what happens. It is modeled as reduction of the transconductance factor beta. So above critical inversion, the transconductance factor drops and the small signal transconductance does not longer significant increase with the drain current. So it's not very efficient to use more current. You don't get more gain for it. That's more or less the story. So the small signal parameters of the model, that, that's what we wanted, can be expressed in terms of technology parameters, geometry parameters, operating conditions. And this is discussed in a book that is called, uh, from David Binkley, Trade-offs and Optimization in Analog CMOS Design. I, it will be available in the library. You can also buy it if you really want to become an expert and you don't, and you don't have to read all, you just read this, this relation because that's really the good thing of the book. And here you see, this is the plots as it is implemented in SlyCap. Here you have the drain voltage stepping and the, uh, the plotting the, 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 the current, the drain source current as a function of the gate source voltage. And here you see this linear region and the saturation region, which just comes because you are here. This is the, and this is of course the channel length modulation that is not horizontal. Yes, it would be like a straight line. Then you don't have channel length modulation. So this is channel length modulation. And if there would be no reverse current modeled, it would just go like this. And ideally it would just stay flat, of course. Now that you can see, you can also model the capacitors in there. And as I told you, the, the I told just in the chat to someone uh, uh, in, the, in the saturation region, the input capacitance it is approximately 67% uh, 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 of the oxide capacitance. Well, you can see this here, how it changes with the voltages. And this is a nice one. This should be this square root curve, the GM as a function of IDS. But due to the short channel effects, 
it saturates. You see here, we are doubling almost the current. If we go from here to there, we're almost doubling the current and almost nothing happens with GM, which means it's not effective to work here with your, uh, with the transistor because uh, it costs you a lot of current, but you don't get extra gain for it. The FT curve almost follows the GM curve. That is because C here in the forward region is just a constant, doesn't depend. Here it is only in the, when it goes from forward to set, uh, from saturation to linear region, then something happens with the capacitance. But for the rest, it's just, it just would be about two thirds of the oxide capacitance. This plot you can make. And this is the complete model that is in sleek up with all the expressions of the EKV. So it has a small signal model, but you can type in the W, the L and the current, and it will then from it calculate the inversion coefficient. And from that, it will calculate all these values and it will track more or less with the BSIM level model that is implemented in LT spice. And that is a nice thing because with the BSIM, you couldn't do this. It is like a non-physical model. It's made for numeric optimization, but not for understanding the mechanism. And it doesn't have uh, this, this simple, well, quite simple relations, I should say. So you, if you are interested, you can view the parameters in this like a model.lib. The, the, the technology parameters, the device equations are with a sub-circuit. This is a sub-circuit in SlyCap. This is a sub-circuit with a few capacitors and uh, controlled sources. And the gains of these controlled sources and the values of the capacitors depend on parameters like I, the IDS, uh, uh, the, the voltages and the, uh, uh, the W and the L. And you can find this model in slycap.lib. That's basically what we are offering you.